effects uh, or changes the gravity of the universe. So the composition, the physics of the universe is on the right-hand side of the Friedman equation, and the kinematics is on the left-hand side. So this equation is sort of the F equals MA for the universe, where we want to learn about the composition. Um, now, we can't directly observe A, the scale factor, or T, time, but we can observe proxies for both of those. So instead of A, the scale factor, we observe or measure redshifts of distant galaxies. Um, and instead of measuring the time to which we are looking, we measure distance. And through knowledge of the speed of light, we can relate that to time. And so in the observer's frame, what's known as the Hubble diagram or redshift versus distance relation is how we can learn about the uh, expansion of the universe, uh, A dot. Now, of course, if we look further into the past uh, by looking out in distance, we can also learn about the, pa the past expansion history of the universe as well. So we can learn about this whole function, A of T. Now, um, it used yeah. to be that the universe was okay. so simple. I put on the headphones. Oh, somebody oh, talking. Should I? Hmm. Yeah. I could try to mute them or maybe um, Kevin can. Uh, Kevin, you might want to mute people who are who you see talking. Um, anyway, as I was saying, so therefore, um, we can derive an equation of motion, this Friedman equation, uh, and we can measure the expansion rate of the universe. Now, we used to think the universe was so simple that it was matter dominated that really all we needed to do was measure just the first two derivatives of A. The first derivative uh, is the Hubble constant. That's the present expansion rate of the universe. It sets the size scale and the age scale for the universe. This was once debated to about a factor of two, um, whether it was 50 or 100. Uh, and the second derivative, again, in a matter-dominated universe, these are the only two numbers you need to know. This second derivative is called the deceleration parameter. Uh, it uh, is determined by the amount of matter in the universe, the mass density of the universe, uh, which tells us how much deceleration there will be. Again, in a matter-dominated universe, Knowing the total matter in the universe also tells us the geometry of space, the ultimate fate of the universe. And this also was once debated whether the universe was dense and would uh, slow or decelerate uh, rapidly, uh, ending in a kind of a big crunch, or whether the universe was only um, lightly filled and therefore was decelerating only uh, a little bit and would expand forever. And the 1990s was really a special time for learning about these properties of the universe because it was the time when we got the first really long range distance indicators, uh, all referred to as standard candles for making empirical measurements of the expansion history of the universe. So in this talk, I'm gonna talk about two kinds of standard candles. So a standard candle is any object in the universe whose luminosity you understand well, or can standardize to understand it well, so that by observing its brightness, you could determine its distance. And probably our two best long range standard candles these days are type 1a supernovae, which are exploding stars. This is a, a white dwarf star, the core of a star that uh, is under degeneracy pressure and reaches the Chandrasekhar limit, probably because it lives in a binary. And so mass is transferred over. When it reaches the Chandrasekhar limit, it gives a very uniform explosion, which is billions of solar luminosities. So these can be seen very far away. The other most used standard candle is Cepheid variables. These are pulsating stars, super giant stars uh, that are hundreds of thousands of solar luminosities. And there's a very good relationship, very tight relationship between the period of their pulsation and their luminosity. The reason being that stars which are more massive have greater luminosities, but take longer to go through uh, an oscillation. And the reason they have an oscillation at all is they are uh, overshooting um, their, their equilibrium point, the hydrostatic equilibrium point, due to a, a, an opacity mechanism in their atmosphere. I could say more about that. So 
In practice, then, we look for type 1A supernovae or these pulsating Cepheid variables. Uh, we standardize them by measuring their periods or uh, other properties. Uh, we use uh, the colors we observe for them to account for sometimes their dust between us and these objects, but that reddens the light, so we can account for that with colors. And we're off to the races to measure distances. So fast forward to the early 2000s, and these tools uh, were used to tell us two uh, interesting things about the universe. One is that it was accelerating, not decelerating at all. And that was uh, seen with high redshift type 1A supernovae that was worked, that I worked on. Uh, and also that the approximate expansion rate or the number called the Hubble constant was around 72 to about 10% precision. Um, and uh, we had a new model of the universe called Lambda CDM, which tried to describe why the universe would be accelerating. And so let me talk a little bit about that. Um, so although we have this model Lambda CDM, we would still like a better understanding, and we really don't have a great understanding of why the universe is accelerating. So option one is that it is Lambda in Lambda CDM. That is uh, a cosmological constant, as Einstein would have called it, or we could just think of it as vacuum energy, a constant amount of energy in empty space, uh, which, of course, in general relativity gives rise to repulsive gravity. Uh, and uh, that is certainly a possibility, although there's a terrible mis- or calculation or disconnect between our understanding of what that vacuum energy level should be and what we actually observe, about 120 orders of magnitude. So we're not thrilled with this explanation. The second possibility is a dynamical dark energy. So that means that there would be a scalar field perhaps in space and the potential energy of that field could temporarily uh, act like we had a cosmological constant, could cause the accelerating expansion. Another possibility is a modification to general relativity on large scales. Uh, and we are trying to test all these possibilities. So how do we proceed in the current era when we don't really know which of these possibilities is right? And because option one, vacuum energy or lambda CDM is really the easiest to calculate, we sort of assume that as the model, and then we do new experiments and look for departures from that model. So the rest of this talk, I'm gonna tell you about what I think of as the ultimate end-to-end -end test for Lambda CDM, and that is to predict and measure the expansion rate of the universe in absolute terms. So just to give you a little more detail what I'm talking about, generically, Lambda CDM, the model, as illustrated here, starts out with the universe dominated by dark matter, neutrinos, photons, and atoms, at very high redshifts in the early universe. And over time, as the matter dilutes, atoms, photons, neutrinos dilute, dark energy doesn't dilute very much. It becomes, the universe becomes dominated by dark energy. And generically, this model predicts an expansion history, which is plotted here over time that looks like this, a dark matter dominated era when the universe is decelerating in its expansion and the dark energy dominated era we live in now where it's accelerating. But what exact expansion rate of the universe would we expect? Well, when we look at observations of the cosmic microwave background, particularly from Planck, we can use the model as it would have looked when the universe was young to predict what the scale of fluctuations would have been like in the early universe. We can compare that to the angular fluctuation spectrum we see. And in that comparison step, we can calibrate the free parameters of lambda CDM. Once those parameters are calibrated, we collapse to essentially one specific uh, line here, one specific expansion history. And that one shown here predicts that the Hubble constant today ought to be 67.4 plus or minus 0.5. And so a powerful test is to use the more direct uh, route to actually measure by the definition, the expansion rate of the universe. Uh, and that becomes a powerful test of this whole story about Lambda CDM and whether we have the right model and whether it's complete. So what I'm gonna talk about now is a project we started about 15 years ago to try to do that, the SHOES project, whose goal was to reach percent level precision in local measurements of the Hubble constant. And the way we proposed to do that was to use a what's called a distance ladder, which I'll describe, 
of sort of gold standard tools for measuring uh, distances. So that's using basic geometry to calibrate the luminosity of Cepheid variables, which I described, and use those to calibrate type 1a supernovae, which can be seen out much further to measure the expansion rate of the universe. We saw ways to reduce systematic errors uh, by collecting the data in a consistent way. I'll describe that. Uh, as well as by making observations in the near infrared to reduce uh, or mitigate the effects of dust. Um, also, through strict propagation of errors and particularly keeping track of covariance so that we can get a realistic uncertainty. Um, this is a Generation 2 project using the Hubble Space Telescope. Generation 1 was the original efforts to measure the Hubble constant to 10% precision. Um, this is a, was a series of competed proposals, about 20 proposals now, and it uh, has now taken up about 1,000 orbits. So it's a lot of time on the Hubble Space Telescope. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about distance ladders. Distance ladders are simple uh, and empirical, but the, the key element is they need to be measured in, or applied in a consistent manner. So let me describe our distance ladder, um, which is basically uh, three steps. The first rung is where we use geometry, and this can be done many different ways, to reach the distance to Cepheid variables and calibrate their luminosity. That uh, I refer to as the anchor step, and is done at distances of kiloparsecs to megaparsecs. Step two, is to identify galaxies nearby, which hosted a type 1a supernova, where we can go back with the Hubble Space Telescope and find Cepheid variables in those galaxies uh, and calibrate the type 1a supernovae. And then finally, type 1a supernovae can be seen uh, at high redshift. Uh, we don't go to too high a redshift because we want to measure the present expansion rate, not the past expansion rate. And so we do that out to about a redshift of 0.1. So there's no astrophysical modeling involved. This is purely empirical. There's virtually no general relativity or lambda CDM involved. I say virtually none, because if we could do this at redshift zero, there would be none. We do it at very modest redshifts. Um, however, it's critical to measure the objects across rungs in a consistent manner. And I'm going to uh, talk about that, but we spend a lot of effort in this project to do just that. So let me start out with rung one. What do I mean by we use geometry to measure the distance of Cepheid variables? Well, the most basic way to use geometry is to measure trigonometric parallax. Um, and so we can look at distant stars like Cepheid variables and measure their trigonometric parallax, the, the angle through which those stars move over the course of a year as the Earth goes around the sun. And the inverse of parallax then tells us the distance. The problem is that most uh, long period Cepheid variables in the Milky Way are very far away. They're kiloparsecs away. And so the parallax angle is very, very small. It's a fraction of a milliarc second. Uh, or for a one sigma measurement would be about a hundredth of a pixel movement of that star on the Hubble Space Telescope. So we need uh, to measure positions to very high precision. So uh, we developed a new technique for doing this about 10 years ago with the Hubble Space Telescope, and that was to spatially scan or drift scan the telescope during the observation so that the stars move by and you can measure the changing separation of the stars over the course of a year to much higher precision than you can with just staring mode observations where you have less pixels involved in the measurements. With this uh, technique, we found we could get to 20 to 40 micro arc seconds. Uh, so that's quite good. That really does get us in the neighborhood of the precision we need. So uh, what I would call approach one um, is to uh, use the Hubble Space Telescope spatial scanning. And what I'm showing here are about eight Milky Way Cepheids, long period Cepheids. There's a data point every six months and this back and forth motion you see is the parallax. Uh, the amplitude tells us the distance. Uh, and uh, we did that to about 3% precision in the Hubble constant a few years ago. This has been overtaken by what I would call approach two. Approach two is to use a new European satellite named Gaia that is measuring very precise parallaxes over the entire sky. And we picked 75 of those and observed their fluxes with the Hubble Space Telescope so that, again, we can compare them to distant Cepheids on the same photometric system. So this is part of reducing systematic errors is using the same telescope 
to make the measurements of the same kind of object across rungs of the distance ladder. Uh, and that has worked quite well. Uh, and then most recently, just in the last few months, what I would call approach two and a half, uh, it still uses Gaia parallaxes, but there are a couple dozen Cepheid variables that live in star clusters, what are called open clusters. And these clusters have hundreds or thousands of bright stars. And instead of being limited to the parallax precision of a single star, the Cepheid variable, we can average the parallaxes of hundreds or thousands of stars in these clusters to get down to about 10 micro arc seconds in the parallax of a couple dozen uh, Cepheid variables. So these techniques now using Gaia have gotten us to 1% precision. And so the what's called the period luminosity relationship of Cepheid variables that I alluded to earlier in my talk, the way we standardize them, uh, can now be done directly with parallaxes in the Milky Way, both calibrating them and measuring this relationship. And so, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, this was unheard of to be able to measure the parallaxes of Cepheid variables. And now it's done very well. And so you see these three generations of measurements I talked about in purple, the ones we did brute force with the Hubble Space Telescope in green, the ones uh, Gaia has measured for 75 Cepheids and in red, the ones that live in clusters where we get even smaller scatter because we have better parallaxes by averaging over the whole cluster. And when Gaia reaches its final expected precision in another five years or so, this should be good to about 0.4% in the Hubble constant. Okay, so this is just one way to uh, geometrically uh, calibrate Cepheid variables, measure parallaxes. Another technique that's very powerful is to uh, measure a geometric distance to a nearby host, like the Large Magellanic Cloud, that has many Cepheid variables in it. And people can measure the geometric distance to the Large Magellanic Cloud by measuring systems in that cloud called detached eclipsing binaries. These are stars orbiting other stars. And by measuring the timing of the orbit that's done through the eclipse event, one can use Kepler's law and geometrically measure the distance to the Large Magellanic Cloud. And a third method that's very powerful is to measure water masers in Keplerian motion around a supermassive black hole in another galaxy, NGC 4258, and uh, use that to calibrate the Cepheids in that galaxy. Um, somebody named Tara Drake, um, if you could mute, that would be fantastic. Um, so uh, we uh, can use these three different techniques uh, to get a calibration that's good to 1%, 1.3% or 1.5%, depending on which of these techniques we use. Okay, so step two, as I said, is to look at galaxies uh, at intermediate distances that hosted type 1a supernovae and go back and observe Cepheid variables in those galaxies. Uh, now we're limited in range to uh, about 40 or 50 megaparsecs. That's how far out we can see Cepheid variables with the Hubble Space Telescope. And there's a good type 1a supernova in that range about once a year. So we've now calibrated uh, all, I would say, 40, 42 type 1a supernovae that have gone off in the last 40 years in that range that are suitable. Um, and that number has grown quite substantially by going back and calibrating those in the last few years. So that by now in 2022, we're up to 42 type 1a supernovae that have been calibrated with Cepheid variables. And this contributes about 0.9% uncertainty in the Hubble constant. Uh, and I want to mention Wenlong Wan, who was a postdoc working with me, who's helped develop the pipeline that we use to uh, find the Cepheid variables. Let me say a little bit about Cepheid variables. So these are the host galaxies. Uh, we come back with the Hubble Space Telescope and we find the Cepheid variables. Where you see the red dots there are the locations of Cepheid variables in these galaxies that previously hosted the type 1a supernovae, um, we find Cepheid variables from their variable light curves. So what I'm showing you here are the composite light curves of all the Cepheid variables in an individual galaxy. They have a very characteristic shape, this kind of sawtooth shape where they rise fast and decline slowly. Uh, and then we measure the period luminosity relationships, like I showed you for the Milky Way, in all of these distant galaxies so that we can directly compare those uh, and measure the distances. Now, as I described before, <clears throat> but I wanted to emphasize here, 
Um, one of the great improvements here is we measure with the Hubble Space Telescope, the Cepheid variables using the same instrument and filters in the anchor galaxies and in the supernova hosts. So that again, these are directly comparable. <clears throat> and we make our measurements in the near infrared to reduce the effects of dust. Um, and so what I'm showing you here are the period luminosity relationships for Cepheid variables in the large Magellanic cloud. And as you go further and further to the red, as you go from optical wavelengths here in orange, all the way to the near infrared here, or D-red and near infrared, um, you can see the narrowing or the tightening of the period luminosity relation because we're getting rid of the effects of dust and we're getting right down to the physics of the uh, Cepheid variables. Okay, step three is to measure the expansion rate of the universe now using type 1a supernovae. Uh, this has been done uh, many times, of course, but there are now expanded samples uh, like the Pantheon Plus sample that we use to make this measurement. We're essentially figuring out what is the characteristic uh, brightness of uh, type 1a supernovae at a given redshift. Um, generally, one cannot do this exactly at redshift zero, so there are higher order corrections I'm showing here for the deceleration of the universe or even the third derivative of the expansion rate, what's called jerk. Uh, but these have a very small impact. That's why I said that it's sort of at the 1% level, the, um, the uh, uh, contribution of things beyond the Hubble constant to this measurement. We don't want to measure too locally because we'd be sensitive to local motions or flows in the universe. And as I said, we don't want to go to too high a redshift, so we're not sensitive to these higher order corrections. So a few hundred type 1a supernovae at sort of intermediate redshift are what we use. So then putting all of this together in one step, this is what we call the three rung distance ladder from the shoes team using geometry many different ways to calibrate Cepheids. That's rung one. Rung two is Cepheids versus uh, type 1a supernovae to calibrate those and then type 1a supernovae versus redshift to measure the expansion rate. And so this is one distance ladder then that reaches out to the expansion uh, Hubble flow of the universe. But we have gotten much more sophisticated in our analysis in the last few years. We've now fully characterized the covariance of data, both of Cepheids and type 1a supernovae. So I'm showing you the covariance matrix of our distance ladder. This is based on 3,200 Cepheid variables, some 300 type 1a supernovae. Uh, and uh, there are five free parameters in the fit. Two are just the fiducial luminosities of our standard candles, type 1a supernovae and Cepheid variables. Two are parameters that characterize Cepheid variables, the slope of their period luminosity relation and any dependence on uh, chemical abundance or metallicity. And then we run an MCMC so we can properly measure the, um, I'm sorry, I forgot to mention the fifth parameter. That one is five log H naught. Um, and so that, of course, is what tells us the Hubble constant. So we can also measure the covariance between the model parameters. Um, that uh, can be important in some cases as well. Okay, so jumping to the punchline, the answer we get is 73.04 plus or minus 1.04, including systematic uncertainties. Um, <clears throat> by running 100 million chains, we can sample the tails and see to uh, a pretty good precision now that <clears throat> we are really five sigma from the predicted value of the Hubble constant that I mentioned earlier using Planck and Lambda CDM. Uh, we get a very good fit to our data, so we don't have no excess variance. Uh, and the uncertainty has now come down from in 2016, just we were at 1.7 uncertainty. Okay, so just going over some tests of robustness of this result, we can separate the result based on different ways of geometrically calibrating the distance ladder. So the three primary ways we use up here looked at individually give values for the Hubble constant like I show here. Um, they're all quite consistent. Um, and then we have also some independent checks from other techniques that uh, we don't use uh, primary, as primary uh, anchors, but we can use them as cross checks. They're less precise individually. But it doesn't look like the uh, result is coming from any the effect of any one of these anchors. So that's very uh, important. They're all quite consistent. <clears throat> Um, we also do various validation tests of our photometry, our ability to measure the brightnesses of the Cepheid variables. And so I'm showing you just a couple of those tests, but there are many more in the paper. For example, do we get consistent measurements of Cepheid variables 
in uh, high density backgrounds versus low density backgrounds where the measurements are easier to make. Um, and so we can compare those within the same galaxy. So I'm showing an example here uh, and they're very consistent to about a hundredth of a magnitude. Um, we have many other tests. Uh, another one is a null test where we look at the residuals from the global fit to the distance ladder versus the local background measurements. Now, um, if we were overestimating the background in the supernova galaxies, um, then uh, we would expect the uh, data points to follow the red line. If we were overestimating in the anchor galaxy, NGC 4258, we'd expect the black points to follow the black line. And instead, we see everything's quite consistent with zero. It's also hard to cook up a way where you would overestimate the backgrounds in galaxies that hosted supernovae, but then not do the same in the uh, Maser host NGC 4258. So um, this is a pretty strong test at this point. Uh, and at this point, we can really rule out impact of uh, this as a systematic. Okay, so in the paper, we go through 67 variants of the fundamental analysis that we do, including bifurcations of the data and extensions. And I don't have time to go into all of those, but I'll just show you some of the ones that people have been most interested in, um, different ways of uh, either removing outliers, different geometric anchors to use, ways of relating uh, color to dust uh, within some reasonableness, uh, the use of uh, metallicity to uh, refine the standardization of Cepheid variables, uh, which sets of supernovae we use. And the bottom line here is it's very difficult for us to get below about 72 and a half or to really get a much above 73 and a half. Uh, the additional scatter from the systematic uh, variance we propagate as additional error in our measurements. Okay, so uh, at this point, I could go through lots of questions that people might have or try to anticipate them. I'll just mention a few and maybe come back to these if people have these as questions later. Uh, could we live in a giant void? And so the universe is rushing out around us, about 9% in the Hubble constant. The answer here is no, both from large-scale structure theory and both from direct measurements from the type 1a supernova Hubble diagram. Uh, there could be maybe 0.6% uncertainty in the Hubble constant, but it's uh, it would be about a 15 or 20 sigma uh, strangeness to live in in such a void uh, in uh, the large scale structure we see around us. Is the Hubble Space Telescope linear enough to make a measurement this well? Yes, actually, it's been calibrated to about 0.3% in our ability to measure the Hubble constant. This is something I do as part of my functional work at Space Telescope Science Institute. I mentioned about the, the, the backgrounds of Cepheid, so I think I've addressed that one already. Um, are there differences in the supernovae across the distance ladder? We put a lot of effort into this, and if you read this paper by Jones at all, you can see there are no correlations in the Hubble residuals to maybe 0.3% in the Hubble constant. Are the different anchors consistent? Yes, really to better the probably than one, one sigma at this point. Um, are other ways of measuring intermediate distances like tip of the red giant branch and Cepheid's consistent? Uh, yes, they are. If you start from the same anchor and go to the same host, you get very consistent results. And this is covered in a couple of papers, or I could say more about that. Can you resolve the tension by changing dust laws in each of the hosts? Uh, no, because um, we're already observing in the near infrared. So the effects of dust on the Hubble constant are already at the one or 2% level. And so errors we make in that are smaller than that. And this is a 9% problem in the Hubble constant, but there's also a number of different papers uh, about that as well. Okay, I wanted to say something about JWST. What will JWST do for this problem? This of course is a new telescope, which has been launched and has greater resolution. I mentioned before about dense backgrounds with Cepheid variables. One of the nice things about a higher resolution telescope is it de-densifies or, you know, it, it makes it easier to see individual objects like Cepheid variables in dense regions. And so uh, we can do a test of what ought to happen when we use JWST simply by taking the data that we have and progressively eliminating the most crowded objects. And when we get down to about the least crowded or most empty, like you see on the left here, third of the data, that's the kind of resolution that JWST will give us. Now, when we do that, we see no pull on the Hubble constant. The value we get is very similar uh, to that. However, even better, oh, sorry, one more test we did is to use 
the most crowded half and least crowded half of the data that has very little effect. But even better than trying to anticipate what the James Webb Space Telescope will give us would be to actually use the James Webb Space Telescope. So we got lucky a few weeks ago, somebody took a serendipitous observation. So I should say, we have a large program in the first year with JWST to reobserve these galaxies and remeasure the Cepheid variables. But that's going to take a while just to get on the schedule and have those observations occur. However, there was a serendipitous observation of one of the galaxies we observed, uh, a type 1a supernova host that ha had Cepheid variables that we previously observed with the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, and even the serendipitous observation was enough to observe uh, a, a good handful of Cepheid variables. So this purple rectangle you see is the JWST near cam footprint. And what we observe with HST is this square you see over here. And you see a little bit of overlap here of Cepheid variables. So if I zoom in on some of those, you could see how exquisite the resolution is of JWST. Here are known Cepheid variables. They're known uh, from their position in the optical. And when we follow them up in the near infrared with the Hubble Space Telescope, you could see the lower resolution and uh, the uh, undersampled pixels gives you effectively poor resolution of those. But with the James Webb Space Telescope, we have much higher resolution and we could isolate them better. Um, and we did this with just this first galaxy and just showing you the period luminosity relationship we have from Hubble uh, in gray versus JWST in red are very consistent. In fact, we just submitted this paper and put it on the archive last week. Uh, the intercept we get is very similar. Um, we see no evidence of a, it would require a shift of the red curve here to the dotted line, to the middle of the dotted line, in order to suddenly find that the Cepheid variables seen through JWST were quite a bit fainter. Uh, than they were seen through Hubble that would explain the Hubble tension. So that that certainly in the first observation doesn't look uh, likely. Uh, of course, I've been talking a lot about the work we've done with this technique or these, these objects. Of course, many other groups have either used our data and reanalyzed it or collected their own data in different ways. And this Hubble tension, this difference between uh, what uh, is predicted and what is observed is not just seen by us, but seen by pretty much everybody who uses this data. Um, this is sort of the last 20 years of observations. The difference here just is over time, the measurements have been getting more and more precise, but the central value hasn't shifted very much. There was even a team recently that went back to the Hubble archive and took the individual pixels and reproduced the measurements that we got in this paper from the Arcaria project. Um, and so this really does look like what uh, the universe looks like on the sky, I would say. Uh, and again, it's not just even this technique, but many other techniques. Uh, if you make that prediction from the early universe using Planck or WMAP or ACT, any of the CMB experiments or Big Bang nucleosynthesis, anything from the early universe to calibrate the model and predict the Hubble constant, you're going to predict something around 67 to 68. Whereas the measurements locally, the direct measure, depending on what techniques you use, vary from about 70 to 75, with the 73 that I've talked about being not only the, the value we get, but a pretty fair average of the different values. So this is problem has become called the Hubble constant tension or discrepancy or crisis, whatever you want to, whatever term you like. It doesn't seem to depend on any one method, any one team, any one source. You can eliminate any certain kind of data, and you're still left somewhere between four to six sigma uh, in significance. So the community is very intrigued by this because uh, it smells like, or it could be new physics in the universe. It could be a missing component of lambda CDM or some wrinkle in lambda CDM that is confounding our ability to start at the early universe and predict the expansion rate today. Uh, right, these are the, the two measurements I've been focusing on, but uh, I talked about the others. There's also a second tension that looks similar. It's a little less significant, but it's similar in many ways. And that is when you compare how clumpy the universe is on eight megaparsec scales, uh, a parameter known as sigma eight or S8, uh, you can likewise predict how clumpy the universe ought to be through expansion and dilution and gravity, 
or you can observe it through other techniques, weak lensing and uh, clustering. And again, just like I showed you with the Hubble tension, systematically, locally, you see a different value for this SA parameter versus what you expect it to be from the early universe. Um, and this is seen, I would say, at three sigma by multiple methods. So all in all, it's probably four sigma at this point. Um, so it smells like the Hubble tension. And so people have tried to think about solutions that could explain one or both of these, and it's hard. Um, there are lots of ideas. Uh, Francis, who is at the at New Mexico, uh, now was uh, at this conference a few years ago and has some ideas that are, I think are quite interesting. Uh, some of the ideas are weird neutrinos, decaying dark matter, another episode of dark energy early in the history of the universe. Some ideas work better. Uh, they don't conflict with other measurements. Some are worse. I list various ones. There are many reviews in the literature. Uh, I can't do justice to this topic, but I'll just mention a review. I'll also mention um, that the most likely solutions are the class of solutions which alter the universe uh, when it was young, before recombination, uh, that in particular uh, cause the universe to expand faster at early times, uh, to uh, make it become uh, transparent earlier that shrinks what's called the sound horizon, the distance that a fluctuation can travel between the Big Bang and when it becomes transparent, essentially changing the calibration of the cosmic microwave background and the expected value of the Hubble constant. There's been some claims in the literature of even seeing independent evidence for this episode in parts of the power spectrum of the CMB. I think the jury is out on that, uh, but people are paying close attention. So what do we do now? Well, at this point, I think we need some very specific hypotheses um, because the data has gotten very good and this is a very challenging problem. So it's easy to say, well, it looks like new physics, but because the data is so good, we need a real detailed explanation of what that is uh, to see whether it would actually pass the data. It's easy to say, well, it just still sounds like systematic errors in measurements. The problem is there's so many independent measurements, independent rungs and duplicate measurements that short of a catastrophic failure of the Copernican principle, um, I haven't heard of a, a hypothesis that th uh, of a systematic or systematics that could actually explain this without a lot of conspiracies. So uh, at this point, it's clear there's some kind of signal and it really requires uh, a specific and testable explanation and uh, also likely more data. Um, so uh, we have continued to chew away at our error budget. I'm showing you the evolution of that. Uh, all our terms are now below 1%. There are a few things on the horizon, like Gaia, data release four and five. Uh, LIGO uh, can contribute to this. Uh, new missions, DESI, LSST, Roman, Rubid, and Euclid. Uh, these are all ways of better characterizing the expansion history recently. Uh, next generation cosmic microwave background experiments could see signatures of, for example, early dark energy or some kind of weird neutrinos. So this is a, an interesting problem worth staying tuned to. So my final thoughts, and then I'll just take some questions, is this discrepancy, oops, this discrepancy is, is about five sigma at this point. Uh, another way to describe this is there's really no precise measurement of the Hubble constant coming from the late universe that comes in any lower than those from the early universe. That's just another way of saying, you know, everything's pretty much on one side or the other side split by whether it's early or late. Uh, it appears robust, this, this tension, as, because it would require multiple catastrophic failures to avoid it. Uh, and I think it's really interesting, unless you know, you're, uh, you, you just love and believe deeply in lambda CDM at more than five sigma, and, or you're willing to discard a lot of data, uh, this is uh, an interesting problem. Uh, and I think it's always important to remember lambda CDM itself is not Maxwell's equations. It's a, you know, a fitting function. It has a lot of phenomenology, but it's missing a lot of basic physics. 95% of it is dark. We don't have quantum gravity. And so uh, it's not crazy to think that there's something missing with lambda CDM and that these tensions could be clues to those. So uh, uh, I will end there and happy to take any questions that you have. Yes, well, let's let's have questions. Um, I should probably try to unmute everybody, but I don't know quite where to click to unmute everybody. So why don't you just unmute yourselves, try to do that if you want to ask a question, or you can use the chat 
Um, and of course, let's thank the speaker, uh, Adam Reese, for a marvelous uh, colloquium. Um, yeah. Let's let's have some questions. Um, I don't, don't be shy. Anybody jump in? <laughs> let's. I have a question. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, so right at the very beginning of your talk, you showed the sixty-seven point four uh, that we were looking for. Uh, that was a that was an assumption of the the, the presence of lambda CBM. I was trying to understand it. If you take away the, is there such a, a meaning to taking away the effect of lambda? What would you have predicted without lambda? Not sixty-seven, but some other number. I I just didn't uh, know that right at the very beginning. Yeah, um, that's an interesting question. I mean, basically, what what you're doing is, you know, the the expansion rate is decreasing, um, and then at some point it actually starts to increase again because of lambda. Um, if you didn't have lambda, uh, you just had dark matter, it would decrease much more, and you probably would have a um, a, a much lower Hubble constant. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, Kevin, well, I have the, a, I have a I question. Agree, do you someone. want to raise a question? Yeah. Can you guys hear me all right? I can. I can. Okay, cool. Um, well, great talk, Adam. Thank you very much. Um, so I've now had the pleasure of attending a talk um, by you now and also by uh, Wendy Friedman. And I have a concern with, um, if you could go back to that De Valentino plot. Sure. Um, so... Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, Sorry, no worries. There. Yep. Almost there. There. Perfect. Okay, so if we compare the indirect, you know, late universe or early universe measurements with the late universe measurements, we see that the tip of the red giant branch and the red or and the Cepheids are statistically um, similar, mm -hmm. and that the red giant branch is also statistically similar with um, early universe measurements. Mm -hmm. But you know, the transitive property doesn't work here, obviously, because uh, the early universe isn't consistent with Cepheid measurements. Right. If and, you didn't have if right you you right there. Okay, go ahead. Sure. Yeah. So, what do you think is causing the slight systematic suppression of H naught from the tip of the red giant branch method? Yeah. Because I, um, I asked Wendy the inverse of this question, so I'm I'm interested in your response. Sure. Um, I have a I have a backup slide. Let me see if I can Perfect. find this quickly. Hold on. So. Right. So ah, here. OK, so when we measure um, Cepheid distances versus tip of the red giant branch to the exact same galaxies, starting from the same anchor, going to the same supernova host. So this is basically only the second rung, the middle rung. Yep. Right? And there are only about eight or eight or nine galaxies that have both measurements. Yep. You get very consistent results. And that's what I'm showing right here. OK. But yeah, so that's it's interesting other, because yeah, um, but there I've, are other factors which go into the calculation of the Hubble constant. So this is sort of a miss. Uh, I don't know. I would say misnomer or something. When somebody says, "What does tip of the red giant branch give?" or "What do Cepheid variables give?" They are only the second rung. They're only the connective tissue. There, there's still the geometric part. How do you calibrate it? And there's the type one a supernova part. What do you use beyond there? And there are some differences. And so I'm going to show you uh, some of those differences. This is in our paper. But between the, there's two different groups that have measured tip of the red giant branch Hubble constant values. Okay. There's the, what you mentioned is, was Wendy Friedman's group that gets about 70. Uh, but there's also the EDD group that uses um, uh, tip of the red giant branch. Uh, and these are two different techniques for fitting tip of the red giant branch. These folks use uh, uh, edge detection and these folks use maximum likelihood or luminosity function fitting. And already that difference there is about 70 to 71 and a half, okay? And if we use the same anchor, the same first rung as these folks, we get 72, okay? So these are at this point, not very different, not even, you know, a sigma difference. Yeah. However, let me go one step further. And another piece of this puzzle is 
Um, there is are differences in the calibration, the first rung for tip of the red giant branch, not Cepheids, but tip of the red giant branch. So tip of the red giant branch, if you're not familiar, but it sounds like you probably are, um, it's not a star. There's no tip of the red giant branch star. It's a feature in the distribution of a large number of stars where you see a break or a change. And so because of that, you can't measure the parallax to tip of the red giant branch like you can for Cepheid variable. So it's harder to calibrate tip of the red giant branch. You need to know the distance to, let's say, another galaxy, absolutely, geometrically, or to a group like a globular cluster or something. And so what I'm showing you here are the last few years of efforts of calibrating tip of the red giant branch. And you could see that there's a range here, and the range is reflected then pretty well in the Hubble constant that you can get. So uh, at the most luminous end, which is what the, for example, Wendy Friedman's group uh, are all these points at the highest end, uh, are this red dash line that gives you about H naught of 70. But there are other groups that have gotten things that are a little bit fainter, 73, even if you're in the middle here, which seems most likely you're in between those. So between the, the calibration issue and some, uh, whether you're actually comparing not just tip of the red giant branch and Cepheids, but the same first rung and third rung, the differences are very minor. I see. That's a great explanation. Thank you. I have a second question, if sure. uh, if that's all right. Yeah, absolutely. So um, this is switching gears a little bit, but yeah. um, George Estafio and mm -hmm. other cosmologists have em emphasized this need to include higher redshift supernova in the Hubble flow data that you that you use in that third rung on the distance ladder? Yes, um, that isn't exactly what they've said, but okay. what, what he has said, and it's a very good point, is if some astronomer, if we measure the expansion rate of the universe, let's say, by measuring, um, calibrating type 1a supernovae at low redshift, let's say redshift 0 0.05, 0 0.1, and then somebody else wants to measure the equation of state of dark energy by comparing the low redshift supernovae to the high redshift supernovae, then you can't just use the Hubble constant and that measure of the equation of state of dark energy as though they're independent things because they're both utilizing the same low redshift sample. And so we think we've addressed this. This is just more of a bookkeeping problem. Let me see if yeah. I have a, I, I, I may have a backup slide on this. Um, I should, it's a nice figure in the paper um, wait, no, that's not it. Um, hold on. Kind of not, not there. Okay. I'm not, not finding it yet. Um, anyway, the, the basic idea is that you have to do good bookkeeping to compare these things. And, uh, and so what we offer now is, um, just the absolute distances to the host galaxies and a set of consistent type 1a supernovae so that you can fit your, arbitrary cosmological model simultaneously to marginalizing over the Hubble constant and do those properly with their covariance. And so, it, as I said, it's really a bookkeeping problem. Yeah. And I think what George was pointing out was people were ignoring the bookkeeping problem. I see. Awesome. Well, thank you. Once again, this is a great talk. So let's see, perhaps there's another question from someone else. Um... Uh, yeah, coming back to the, the James Webb. So yeah. basically, uh, you've done some preliminary studies that show that uh, with the additional uh, resolution, you're not necessarily expecting any kind of different results. Um, uh, no surprises there, you're saying? Uh, are, you, are you crossing your fingers that somehow you'll be proved wrong, or do you expect nothing new to come of the James Webb? In this you know, I don't... I... I mean, I think we will learn things, and I think we will learn things that are relevant for this problem. What I suspect is that we will learn things that will allow us to uh, get down to 1% in the Hubble constant. I don't think we're going, from what we've seen already, I don't think we're going to see a gross order shift that uh, explains the Hubble tension. Right. So I think it, it will be helpful as we try to get down to 
you know, do even better. But I don't think it's it's going to be a big reset of this. I mean, at least from the first data we've seen, it doesn't look like it. And, and from the tests we've done, we wouldn't expect it. But, you know, that's still why you do the measurements. Thanks. Maybe I'll ask a question. Sure. Um, could you uh, explain a little more what S8 is and um, yeah, how it might, uh, how you might explain both it and the Hubble trouble? Right. So, so S8 is the you could think of it as the standard deviation or variance of uh, the the density of matter on eight megaparsec scale. So if you can imagine, you know, patches or, or cubes, eight megaparsecs across, it's the statistical variation in the matter density in those different cubes. Um, and so in a clumpy universe, sigma eight will be very high. And in a smooth universe, it will be low. And so what we see between the Hubble tension and sigma eight is we live in a faster expanding and smoother universe than we expected. And it's hard to cook up um, theories that do both of those things. Um, not saying that there aren't any, there are some, but it's uh, it, it hasn't been easy for people to come up with ways that doesn't, you know, at the same time violate other parts of the cosmic microwave background data, for instance. But when you say um, eight megaparsecs, do you mean eight megaparsecs now or eight megaparsecs? Right, it's eight protect, megaparsecs uh, now, um, but it's, and it's, it's arbitrary, it's, it's kind of the arbitrary place that power spectra are often normalized. So it's given as the reference point. But eight megaparsecs now would have been I don't know, a few meters back, uh, or not not a few meters, but kilometers. Not, I'm not an astronomer. Um, but it would have been a much shorter distance back at the time of 380,000 years. Sure. But we know that. So <laughs> so that's in the calculation as well. So so what do you mean? Do you mean the cars? Yeah. Do you well, mean? Yeah, what, what we mean is we can make a prediction. We can see how clumpy the universe was on real scales back then. And then our understanding of gravity and dilution allows us to predict on eight megaparsec scales. This is this is linear theory. And so there's no complex uh, interactions to deal with. We can figure out how that um, how gravity evolves the the large scale structure of the universe so that it how it would look on eight megaparsec scales. So both both S8s are on a scale of eight mega eight current megaparsecs. Sure, yes, that's right. Okay. Just like Hubble constant predictions from the cosmic microwave background are at the present time. Sure. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Not in the past. Okay. So both are predictions of what we see now. Yes. Okay, thank you. Let's see, there must be- uh, I have another question. Um, sure. But I don't want to dominate the time. No, I, go ahead. Okay. Uh, so um, almost an opinion question. Um, so going forward, one of the, what, what do you think is the most promising direct geometric measurement technique of the Hubble constant moving forward? Do you think it that the most promising technique is going to be with gravitational waves or with uh, like the... Right. So the there's two things that, that yeah. I'm aware of that you know, okay. are intriguing. One is, um, it, can you see this data point that says masers here in yep, orange? Sure can. Okay. So that is using um, masers out in the Hubble flow. And this is mm -hmm. purely geometric. It's not a distance ladder. It's a one-step geometric method out into the Hubble flow. Um, and uh, it's been measured by the Maser Cosmology Project using, I, I guess, VLA or VLBI, sorry, VLBI measurements. Um, and my understanding from the people who make those measurements uh, in the radio is um, if they substitute the uh, uh, EHT, the Event Horizon Telescope, this sort of all Earth telescope that's been used to uh, resolve down in the core, uh, you know, black holes in the Milky Way and nearby galaxies, um, if they use that instead of the, the LBI for the maser measurements, for the same set of masers, they'll get much higher resolution. They'll get down to a few percent per maser. And even with these six masers or so, this should give you, oh, a factor of a few improvement in this 
measurement, the one you see in orange, which that should be pretty definitive then mm -hmm. uh, at that point. So that's one technique I like. And another one is the use of LIGO uh, to measure standard sirens, gravitational wave uh, from um, in-spiraling um, uh, neutron stars, kilonovae, with optical counterparts. That's been done once for an event in 2017. And there was an expectation that there'd be a lot of them by now, but there just haven't been and LIGO's been offline. But um, I'm optimistic in the next five to 10 years, that method can be fairly definitive as well. Okay, cool, thank you. So we have um, time for some more questions. Um, Does somebody want to speak up? I would think one of our astronomers would want to say something. Um, <laughs> well, we're at, we're at the end of the hour, so that's okay. Yeah. Um, and people can be feel free to email me any questions that you have if you felt too shy to speak. Um, and uh, thank you very much for uh, having me. Well, thank you for an excellent talk, um, excellent physics and astronomy. And um, it was very kind of you to, to do this. And so let's all thank... Uh, Professor Reese, either uh, virtually or acoustically. Um, so thanks very much. And I guess I'll stop the recording. All right. Um, and unfortunately, I started the recording, recording about two minutes late, but the meat of the talk got, um, got recorded. Um, as I said, I only missed two minutes. And one of those was probably me. So that doesn't matter. Very good. All right, All right everybody, take yeah. care. Yes. Goodbye. Bye. <laughs>